today we've got the Rayneo Air 3S that we're going to be testing uh, for the optical path after a brief teardown and to try and understand how the optics in this particular unit work versus the X-Real uh, Airs that we have tested before. Uh, I suspect we'll see a lot of the same uh, birdbath optical design that we saw in the previous unit. Uh, but just to take a look at what the manufacturer tells us about the specification first and we'll put on the unit uh, i do think that this is a much more comfortable unit and so uh, the hinge design towards the front uh, of the temple is much more comfortable for extended use i've used this for quite a few weeks at this point and i uh, can definitely notice the significant reduction in overall pressure that's being put on the head however the main thing that we're looking at is, again, uh, the optical path and the optical function of the device. What I think we can see is that generally we have some of the same issues with uh, these lower cost designs that without the electrochromic film, without the dimming of the piece of plastic in the front that we get on some of the higher end devices, the more budget or entry level devices, you do have a lot of light leakage to the outside world. And so you'll see quite a bit of, um, of reflections that are passing through the half mirror uh, and ending up towards the world side so people can realistically see what you're looking at. I suspect that they don't have the same Sony device that Xreal is using for any of their products. Um, there's another manufacturer called Sia, and we'll take a look at the panel once we break this apart to see if it truly is a Sia panel and maybe even an entire Sia optical module. So the Rayneo folks uh, say that, again, this is another micro OLED panel. Um, I suspect that that is very true based on the heat that's being generated right here above the brow. Uh, that means that we have two very hot running micro OLED panels. They also claim about 650 nits delivered to the user's eye. If they have a standard bird bath design, we're going to have very high losses through the optical path that is probably not going to be a full 650 delivered to the user's eye, uh, probably closer to 500. Now, of course, the panel may be much, much higher um, initial brightness, and we'll test that in comparison to the Sony panels. It's interesting that they note here that they're using a tandem OLED. Um, I'll put a, a link in the description or uh, something you can click right here, but this is actually a very new type of uh, OLED technology for larger screens. Um, you might be familiar with them in the iPad Pro, for example, this, if they're truly using a tandem OLED, is actually um, quite interesting because it's a pretty expensive technology, not quite as big of a difference in the small micro OLED, but quite a large uh, expense when it comes to, to big screens. So it'll be interesting to see if we can dig that up uh, in the SIA documentation. Overall uh, impressions of the device are, again, quite comfortable, um, worn this for multiple hours a day, a couple days, uh, and there's really no issue that I see with the device. Uh, again, brightness control uh, on the right temple. We can actually turn this up to max brightness. And again, it's very, very bright. We'll say outside, we do have the stereotypical issue that uh, light can bleed through the world, uh, even through the restrictive light that you get from these glasses. But again, these are now being marketed explicitly for sitting in an office or living room environment. So there's no concerns that the, the brightness range that you get out of this display, even if it doesn't reach the full 650 nits to the eye, is more than enough to play a Switch, a Steam Deck, or even some mobile phone games. Uh, overall, I think it's a pretty good device. Uh, again, no major um, concerns. Uh, versus some of the x real devices that we see on the market today, especially because there's really um, no major difference <laughs> in the, the birdbath design. Uh, the real um, differentiation here comes from the overall um, industrial design of the headset. And I will say that uh, it's possible that the specific materials that were chosen here make it such that we don't get quite as much thermal buildup uh, in the temple. This runs at 120 hertz native. Uh, you can downgrade to 60 hertz operation to save bandwidth and battery uh, if you have a battery limited device that you're plugging into this headset. But overall, even uh, at 120 hertz, um, it's, it's 
not cool to the touch by any means, but it is not going to make you uncomfortable during operation. Again, you will notice some heat uh, towards the brow here. Overall, a great device, and we'll look forward to opening it up and see what's inside the display. With these four screws off, we can now just push on this front element and completely disassemble the front plate, leaving behind just the optics and display and proximity sensor. So we'll, we'll continue to tear this apart um, and see uh, exactly what components are being used here. I suspect a lot of the same ones that we've previously discussed, but uh, now you can see this is a much easier entry uh, for any potential reassembly that you might have to do on this one than the very, very glued in um, X-Real Air design. Once we are in to the front plate, we can see that there's three Phillips head screws that we're going to have to undo to uh, remove the motherboard from each side, and then one in the center that I've already taken out uh, to get the nose piece area uh, untethered as well. With the arms removed from the um, plastic housing, uh, after we've removed all of these screws, we can just slide the optical module out of the front housing. Remove this as well, just an injection molded piece of plastic uh, with the transmissive front window for the proximity sensor that detects if your face is there or not uh, to turn off the display and save power if you've taken them off. So now you can see we've got uh, essentially a very, very similar looking optical module as uh, the other X-Real display. Uh, we now have the motherboard that is affixed to the top of the optical module. And we've got a couple of screws here uh, that we're going to have to take off to make sure that the motherboard can come off of the optical module cleanly. And then we can get access to each of the displays and the lenses. So we'll take a look. So now we've been able to remove the optical module, uh, which is again all of our uh, lens assemblies plus the two OLED displays from the main motherboard and the stems of the glasses. One advantage though for this type of construction where we have basically a single body that uh, is used to actually house the lens elements and lens module as well as the two display modules is that now it has a very fixed distance between the lenses and the display, the, the lens to panel distance if you will, uh, that is fully defined by the injection molding tolerance of this particular component here. And so from a manufacturing perspective, we have a very, very cheap process flow to make uh, what ultimately gives us the mechanical tolerance for each of these lenses. We can actually start bending the display module off of the main body of the optical module. We can see now we have still a little bit of uh, glue bead left towards the end here. However, the main micro display with the, the field lens that ultimately magnifies our image uh, and the rest of the optical path here. What I will say uh, is nicer for these modules is that we've started to get uh, in more of the recent designs a lot of light blocking. So you can see how now we have a black shield on the sides of our field lens. This provides uh, protection from the light coming out of uh, the field lens as it's getting magnified from the display. We can't avoid that this light is actually going to be wasted when it hits the black uh, component, but at least the light now won't shine into the rest of the system and create other reflections that we don't want uh, delivered to the user's eye. So that's, that's quite nice to see. On the optical element side, or on the lens module side, we really just have two lenses. What we see is going to be the reflective, the first reflective surface and that reflective polarizer, and then the uh, half mirror that bounces everything back, changes the polarization state, and ultimately allows for the light to pass back to the user's eye. So these are two elements that are just glued in place uh, on the uh, outside of our optical module body here. So we'll separate those as well uh, and see what radio is doing. Here. And with a little bit of gentle nudging, we're able to get the half mirror lens to 
cleanly out of the main body. A little bit of isopropanol still left on here. Uh, we'll take a look at exactly how this functions a little bit later, but the, this is the ultimate reflective surface that uh, the light hits before it goes into your eyes. And unfortunately, unlike our half mirror lens, our reflective polarizer lens doesn't seem to have been quite so lucky. Uh, I suspect this is a different, more brittle uh, plastic lens material that they've chosen, like an acrylic instead of a polycarbonate. But uh, we'll take a look and see if we can remove the films and see the overall functionality of this bird bath as well. For this, Rainio Air 3S optical module. Um, the lens assembly was much tougher to get out, especially the front lens, uh, the first reflective path that has our reflective polarizer and our quarter wave plate. Uh, what you see here is we've taken out both the rear lens, the lens that faces the world, and the front lens, the lens that faces your eye. And we've taken apart the top layer of this lens element. This would be a two layer construction, a quarter wave plate, uh, which is going to be the top layer and changes the circularity of our polarization as it comes into our reflective polarizer. And then it's going to have a reflective polarizer, which is uh, essentially an absorbed polarizer in one direction um, and a uh, complete mirror in the other direction. What we saw in this one is that the top layer, the quarter wave plate, peeled away from the lens, but I suspect we took a little bit of the reflective polarizer uh, component to it. This is a very delicate film construction. Um, we won't get into the manufacturing details there. Essentially, we now have just a linear polarizer left on this element right here. We can take a look at linear polarizers versus quarter weight plates by taking another strip of linear polarizing film. And when we put it on top of a, another linear polarizer that is turned 90 degrees, we have complete black, basically zero transmission of the light from underneath. And as we rotate 90 degrees here, you can see we have now pure transmission through this linear polarizer that's in my hand. On the other hand, on this element here, the uh, quarter wave plate and a little bit of the reflective elements, if we put the linear polarizer on top, uh, because we are not changing the polarization uh, perfectly with a quarter wave plate. We're only changing it by a quarter wave. Any direction that we turn our linear polarizer in is going to only change the amount of light that's coming in as it's been pre-polarized going through the quarter wave plate. And it's going to actually change a little bit of the color, but much harder to see in this configuration. So let's split apart the display. We have a good bit more complicated module compared to the X reels. Um, we still have the same lens, but again, this time the lens actually has uh, some black cover on either side of the lens, so we don't have any extra light leakage through the side of this field lens element. We have our uh, housing for the display module. So this is again uh, precisely mated to the optical module that we have here, uh, but this is ultimately what defines the distance between the emitting surface, the display surface here, and all of the other reflective surfaces. So this is a pretty uh, precision injection molded piece of plastic. We have our overall display module here. This is actually not a Sony module. Uh, we'll take a look and see if we can find the manufacturer for this. It could be Ciatec, it could be uh, BOE, but uh, I'm actually not sure who makes this module just yet. And then finally, we do have this uh, shield can, this metal piece that is essentially on the back side of the silicon. This did have a small amount of thermal compound here. Um, it's a thermal tape, uh, not a thermal paste. And so once this is taken off, essentially we'll never get that same good thermal contact between the OLED micro display and the cover. And then the one film that we have here is again, a polarizer plus a quarter wave plate. Again, from the, uh, this orientation is exactly how we had it on the display. So if we put a linear polarizing element, we see a little change in color and change in intensity, but overall no loss of complete light transmission, which means that a quarter wave plate is on top of this element. And then if we flip it over, and do the exact same thing, 
now we can see that we have either full light transmission or full light blockage. So that means that we have an absorptive polarizer on the back side of this element, aka this is the side that's in contact with the display. So again, we emit unpolarized light from the display, go through the absorptive polarizer, lose about 50% of light, and then also get linearly polarized light. Then we will go through the quarter wave plate that is on the back side here and make a circular polarization, which is ultimately how we're able to bounce off of the lens module elements that we will talk about later. So here we have the final deconstructed lens and display module. Again, on the right side here, the right eye, we have the original uh, with all the lens elements installed and still the display mated to the uh, outer housing. And then on the left side, we have all of the components that we take a look individually earlier. So again, starting on the left here, we have our display module, the OLED micro display here in the center, followed by the shield can, which is essentially used as a heat sink to pull heat away from the OLED during operation. The uh, plastic housing, which controls precisely the distance between the display and the rest of the optical services. In between the lens and the display, we actually have a circularly polarizing film, aka an absorptive polarizer plus a quarter wave plate. And then finally, a field lens that magnifies the image and prepares it for the optical bounces that we get from the lens module on the right side of the screen. On the right side of the screen, we will actually intersect with this lens first. This lens is our reflective polarizer that has a quarter wave plate, which we see delaminated here from the lens assembly. It will hit the uh, quarter wave plate, go through and reflect from the reflective polarizer into our half mirror. You see a little bit of color to the half mirror in this case. Um, I think the PVD control is probably just of a wider tolerance than we saw in previous models. But again, we use this to essentially bounce light back to the reflective polarizer with a different polarization and finally deliver the light to the user's eye. Okay, so with that, we are now done with the Rainio Air 3S teardown. Uh, I think the glasses look a little bit better uh, with the front plate off, but um, definitely less functional at this point uh, with one of the modules taken out. Overall, really great standard bird bath design that we've seen in a lot of products from Xreo, um, Vitur, uh, and obviously Ray Neo. The overall value, I think, for this particular device is much higher because of the low price point uh, and overall pretty good optics um, that you're getting at that price point. So this is a, a very good option for somebody on a budget and wanting to experiment with bird bath optics. So if there's any ideas as to what to tear down next, uh, let me know, and we'll see if we can get it on the next episode of these teardowns. Thanks.